Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning, and it's a blessing to be with you. I want to thank you for being here this morning and uh, bringing encouragement to me already by so many of that I've been able to meet uh, this morning. Uh, we certainly uh, appreciate the PACs. As Shane has mentioned, we uh, have become good friends over the last several years and, and uh, look forward to meeting and getting to know many of you better this week. Uh, it's always a privilege, no matter uh, who you are, if you're a child of God, as we come together, we have something in common, and we're going to grow, uh, hopefully, together this this week. I've already received that encouragement, and, and I'm looking forward to the, to the rest of this week together as we, we open God's Word and we study together. I know many of you don't know me at all, and hopefully we'll get to know you better, as I mentioned, but uh, it must say a lot about uh, Shane and Brandy that you've uh, received me without uh, knowing me just on their recommendation. So uh, I know you think highly of them, and, and so do we. And so hopefully this will not be a disappointment. If it is, it's my fault. If this is a successful meeting, it is to the glory of God. This morning, I want you to think, first of all, uh, back to the time when you were a child, and maybe you wanted something that you had asked from your parents or someone uh, for your birthday. And you've been looking forward to it for so long. You were so excited about this one item, whatever it may have been, a bicycle or something big. And then you got it for your birthday. And, and, and yes, you liked it, but after a while you realized, you know, this just wasn't what I thought it would be. Or, or maybe you're a preteen and, and, and you just keep looking forward to those people who are in high school. And you just keep thinking, things are going to be so much better for me when I get there. This is going to be so much fun. But you get there and you realize, this isn't any fun. Uh, this isn't what I expected. Or even as a teenager, you just can't wait to get to college, get out of the house, get out on your own, and, and you get there and you realize, nope, this isn't what I expected either. Or even in college, you're ready to get out into the real world and you soon find out you got bills and you got all these responsibilities and there's not as much free time as you had before and you think, wow, this wasn't what I expected either. E even as adults, we think, oh, I just... Can't wait till I get this new car. And you look for it and you do all this research on it for months, maybe years, or this new house or new job or new position. And you finally, it comes to the time where you get those things and you're on the other side of it. And you think, you know, this just isn't what I thought it would be. It's not what I expected. You know, the sad reality of life is that life is full of events and circumstances that don't turn out the way that we anticipated for them to. Plans fail. The outcomes of our goals aren't what realized what we thought they would be. Relationships do not turn out the way that we thought that they would or should. It's like the man who got a birthday card from his wife, and on the outside of it, it said, Sweetheart, you are the answer to my prayers. But then he opened it up, and inside it says, You're not what I prayed for exactly, but apparently you're the answer. Evidently, her marriage was not what she expected. Life is going to be full of situations where we hoped for the best, but it didn't quite turn out the way that we thought they would. And you know, sometimes the Christian life is that way as well. Anyone who has made a serious commitment to God is going to run into situations where they're going to end up saying, God, this isn't the way I thought it would be. Being a Christian is not exactly what I expected. And, and I think part of the problem may be that we have the wrong idea of what the Christian life is all about. But another part of it may be that God has a completely different plan for your life than what you thought. Well, this morning I want to examine a passage from Matthew chapter 11. And I want us to examine the life of a young man in the New Testament who was expected to have a long and prosperous life in the work of God. But probably things didn't turn out the way that he and everyone else around him expected for it to happen. And this man's name was John. Now we know him best maybe by the term John the Baptist or John the, the Immerser. But from this, I hope this morning, that we learn that the Christian life isn't always what we expect it would be. But that's okay. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that it's different. But before we actually look at Matthew chapter 11 this morning, I want us to examine the events that are leading up to this passage in his life. You know, even before John was born, an angel appeared to Zacharias, who was his father, in the temple. 
And in Luke chapter 1 and verse 13, the angel says to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will name him John. And you will have joy and gladness. This is what you expect. Joy and gladness from the life of this man. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine, no liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb, and he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and it will be he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so that to make ready a people prepare for the Lord. So no doubt, as this boy comes along, and, and, and as he grows up, he kept hearing stories about this miracle child born to his parents after they had no doubt given up hope of ever having children, having this child in their old age. And, and the news spread, of course, of, of how Zacharias could not speak from the moment that he first received news that he was going to have a son till the time in which this boy was named and he wrote his name on a tablet. And people would look at him and say, wow, this boy one day... He is going to do some great things. Do you remember his birth? But even though his father had served in, in a Levitical uh, fashion, he did not become a, a priest in that way. And, and even though we don't know for sure, his mother and father probably died while he was in his young age. We don't know what the age was there. But they were elderly when they first had John. And as a young man, maybe even without a family, he goes out and he lives in the desert places. And besides his birth, nothing really happened excitingly in the first few decades of his life like the prophecies talked about. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 4, it tells us that his dress, his clothing was, was made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist. And his diet consisted of locust and wild honey. Not exactly what you would expect from someone who was great. Here's a man who's living this simple life out in the desert away from people. And he must have been thinking in some way, Lord, this isn't what I expected my life would be. This certainly isn't the, the life that others expected from me. My, maybe not even my parents. But he hung in there with the Lord. And this is not really what others were thinking of him. People pretty much had, had forgotten about his miraculous birth and his alleged mission from God. He's probably in his 20s now. And, and when people saw him, they probably looked at him and said, well, there's a man who didn't turn out the way that we expected this to happen. But then one day, it says in Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, that the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And God must have said, John, I've heard your prayers time and time again, but the time wasn't right. But now it's time for you to do what I promised that you would do. It was about 25 or 30 years ago that God had made this promise to his parents, and now it is starting to be realized. And part of the reason that we don't get what we expect from God, I think many times, is because we think of it as praying today and getting the answer right away. Uh, that we are impatient. That we live in this day of age where we order something on Amazon, we want it today. We want it the next day. We have food and we don't want to wait around and cook it. We put it in the microwave and we get it right away. And I think many times with our prayer life, we think of it the same way. We pray to God and we want our answer right now the way that we want it. God promises to provide for us. But I want you to understand that it may not always be right away. And it may not always be the way in which we think it should be answered. John had been in the desert, no doubt disciplined in himself. And he was waiting for that right moment. And when the moment came, he was ready. And God came to him, and he came out of the desert, and now John is just preaching up a storm. In Matthew chapter 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And people were coming from all over the place to him. All Jerusalem were going out, and all Judea from the district around the Jordan. And I want you to notice what his message was. In Matthew chapter 3, and verse 8, Bring forth fruit, keeping with repentance. Change your life around, and you ought to see it manifested in your life, this repentance. 
In verse 10, he said, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down, it's thrown into the fire. Verse 12, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. His message was, you better get your act together. You better repent, because judgment is at hand if you don't. And so his message to the religious leaders as you go back in this passage was, you brood of vipers. Who told you to repent? In other words, what are you doing? You're not sincere. You need to change around. He tells the soldiers of that day, the tax collectors, the crowds, you better change what you're doing. Quit your lying, your stealing, and start loving people the way God intended. Hell is just around the corner if you don't change, and you all are headed straight for it. That's the message of John the Baptist. He didn't mince words at all. And people were coming from all over, as we read, to hear John preach these things. And they would fall on their knees in repentance. And verse 6 tells us that they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River and they confessed their sins. And these crowds, they're just getting bigger and they're getting bigger and nothing like this had happened in Israel for centuries now. And as a result, some of the Jews were thinking, you know this John... He might just be this long-awaited Messiah that we've been looking for. And all the people, it says in Luke 3, in verse 15, were in a state of expectation. They were looking for the Messiah, thinking the Messiah might come right now. And some of them were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether or not he might be the Christ. Their expectation is he might be the Christ. But John's response was to them, As for me, I baptize you with water, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The people had great expectations for John, but it turns out he wasn't what they expected. He wasn't the Messiah. Well, one day, things began to change, and that is when John the Baptist saw Jesus. He had already baptized Jesus. And remember, he saw the Holy Spirit descending upon him as a dove. But in John chapter 1, Jesus came walking in the vicinity of John. And John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the man, he says. This is the one on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who is of higher rank than I, for he existed before me. He's not like a man like you and I. He is God who existed in some form before you and I did. In fact, down in verse 33, he says, I didn't recognize him at first, because no doubt he looks just like you and I. He's a man, he wears sandals, he has a robe on. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remain upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen, I've borne witness that this is, notice, this is the Son of God. This is the man that I was told beforehand I would see the Holy Spirit descending upon him. This would be the evidence of the Messiah. This is the Son of God. John believed that. And some of John's disciples then began to follow Jesus. In verse 37, he pointed to him and said, this is the man. And so Andrew, Peter's brother, had been a disciple of John until he points him to Jesus. And Andrew goes and says to Nathaniel, we have found the Messiah. What I want you to understand is John is doing exactly what John was supposed to do, point people to the Messiah. John had been sent to preach and prepare the people to receive Jesus. And so even after Jesus began his ministry, John continued to preach, but the crowds were getting smaller and smaller. People are now starting to go to Jesus. And one day, some of John's disciples, maybe a little bit upset about this, come to John about this in John chapter 3. And they said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have borne witness, behold, he's baptizing, and now all these people are going to him. We don't understand this. This is, this is not what we expected. Teacher, you, you know that guy that you pointed out? Well, everybody's going to him to be baptized. What are we going to do about this? This, this, this is what we expected when we started following you. John's disciples had different expectations of what would happen. Well, in the following verses, John basically says to him, listen, I didn't come to compete with him. I I came to prepare the way for him. I'm glad that all this is happening the way it is. I'm I'm happy for what I was able to do, but I'm even happier 
for what he is now doing because that was the whole goal. And he sums it up in verse 30 by saying, he must increase and I must decrease. And so John kept on preaching and he never did hold back what needed to be said. But I tell you, that got him into trouble sometimes. In fact, one day John went to Herod and John told him that you ought not to be in this adulterous relationship. Now, the Herod that is spoken of here, as we're going to read in Matthew chapter 14, is Herod Antipas. He is the son of Herod the Great who tried to kill all the baby boys when Jesus was born. And he uh, was married, but there was a scandal that was going on in the palace. Herod had gotten involved with his brother's wife, Philip's wife. And uh, because he was married, of course, he had to get rid of his first wife. And he took on this other wife, Herodias, Philip's wife. And, of course, the Jewish leaders must have been displeased by this with Herod committing adultery. And they were probably even more outraged because, according to the law of Moses, this was considered actually incest by having your brother's wife. But they were afraid to say anything publicly about this relationship because you just don't mess around with Herodias. She is serious. And they didn't want to lose their official positions. But more importantly, they didn't want to lose their heads. But John, John's different. He wasn't afraid of losing any position. Because frankly, he didn't have a position. And he was also willing to call sin, sin. No matter who it was, even a king who was doing it. So John condemns Herod and Herodias. And as a result, Herod has him arrested. And if Herodias would have had her way then he would have been put to death right away. Herod wanted to kill John, as a matter of fact, but he was afraid. One, because he's a righteous man, but second of all, he's afraid of what the people would think because they think he's a prophet. People liked him, and if he had him killed, it would just cause a riot. And there's no doubt that John wanted these two adulterers to change. But if that's what he was expected, then he was greatly disappointed. Herod had John arrested, as I mentioned had him thrown into prison. And we're not talking about one of our modern prisons. I mean, we hear about today prisoners complaining that they don't get enough channels on their television set, that they don't get internet speeds that they want. For John, this is a dark, dingy dungeon that he shared with other criminals and with the rats and hardly got any meals at all. And for any man, that would have been a terrible fate. But for John the Baptist, it was worse, if you think about it, than most men. Because here's an outdoorsman. Here's a man who's used to living out in the desert all of his life. He had these wide open spaces with the sky above him and the wind at his back. And now he's confined to these four narrow walls of this underground dungeon. And I imagine after being there for a month, John's thinking to himself, you know, this is not what I expected. There he sat looking at this cold, damp walls of this prison cell. And this first month turned into two. And two turned into four. And four turned into eight. And all of these large crowds that he used to preach to are now just this distant memory. And his hearing about these reports, meanwhile, about what Jesus is doing out there. And I wonder if John would have thought to himself, why isn't my relative Jesus doing something to get me out of this place? And so eight months turned into 12, and 12 turned into to 15, and 15 to 18. And, and when you're going through a period of like this in your life, when you're in these prison experiences that we all go through from time to time, it seems like an eternity. Maybe it is only 18 months that, that, that seems like a speck of time in, in regards to eternity. But in our minds, when you are going through the trial, when you're going through this deep, dark time, it seems like forever. And you may want to cry out, how long, Lord? How long are you going to continue to allow me to be in this dark situation? This is not what I expected at all when I committed myself to you. Now we come to Matthew chapter 11. And Jesus is continuing his ministry all the while John is in prison. And John may have called some of his own disciples to him and said, hey, what's going on out there? 
And the disciples start to report to him what Jesus is doing. However, the report may have been something like this. Well, the crowds, they're flocking to Jesus, but John, I want you to understand, he's not like you. Uh, instead of preaching judgment that you've been talking about, he's out there preaching mercy and, and grace and forgiveness. And, and whereas you are a strong, rugged man who avoids any type of pleasure, you even fast, he's out there feasting. And he's eating with these tax gatherers and, and these sinners. And he hugs little children. He makes prostitutes feel welcome coming to him. And Herod hasn't arrested him. Master, are you sure that he's the one? Is it possible that you, maybe you've made a mistake? And to all this, no doubt, John might have said, well, I'm sure he's the one God pointed out to me. The Holy Spirit landed upon him. But maybe, maybe there's another one who will come to bring the judgment that I was talking about. So he sends his disciples to Jesus with a message. When, when John in prison heard the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to him, are you the expected one? Or should we look for someone else? Are you what we expected? Now it appears that John might have had a different expectation of the Messiah. Maybe he expected him to be a little bit more like himself. I don't know what his expectations were, but there's a little bit of confusion here on John's account. And John's disciples go to Jesus, tell him what, the, what, what, what John asked. And they said, now Jesus, we want to know the truth. And we need to take this back to, to John. Are you the one who is to come or should we look for somebody else? Just Things aren't adding up here. Surely if, if Jesus did have the power of the one to come, then he ought to be able to get John out of prison. Now Jesus here knows that John could use great words of encouragement right now. And he didn't rebuke John's disciples for their question. He didn't say, no, 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 what are you thinking? Why did you ask this? Instead, look at his response, beginning in verse 4. Jesus answered to them, Go and report to John what you hear and, and, and what you see, all the things you're hearing and seeing. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Go tell John everything that you're seeing, all these miracles, the people being healed. And, and I can imagine one of John's disciples saying, but just tell me plainly, are you him or are you not? And I can imagine Jesus said, no, just go tell him what I said. John will understand. Because you see, what, what Jesus is doing here in verse 5, he's actually quoting or at least referencing Isaiah chapter 61. And the Isaiah chapter 61 speaks of this coming Messiah and the great things that he would do. And he knows that John would know the Scriptures, and this would confirm Isaiah 61, that this would be a fulfillment of it. This is your answer. Yes, I am the Messiah. And so John's disciples take the word back to John, and their relaying of, of the message is not recorded in the biblical text here. But no doubt he understood the reference to Isaiah's prophecy. And this confirmed that Jesus was the Messiah that he had been shown, even if the Messiah may not have been what he expected. That's hard for me to imagine John not asking his disciples at that point, what, did he say anything about me getting out of prison? I've been in here a while. When, when is all of this going to end? It already been a year and a half. How much longer would he have to languish inside these dark walls? His faith may have been kept alive by remembering the ways that God had used him in the days that had gone past and God's faithfulness to him and to his parents. You know, sometimes even though our circumstances aren't exactly what we expected, they don't turn out the way that we thought that they would, we have to remember the goodness of God wherever we are. This part of my life that I'm going through right now, it may not look like what I had hoped it would look like, but look at all the good God has done for me. It is overwhelming how much good there is to how much difficulty I might be going through.
And John may have been praying, Lord, will you do something to get me out of here? Be careful what you ask for, because God just might do it. God may do what we ask. It may just not be the way that we expect Him to. So often I tend to think, or we tend to think of God getting us out of a situation. And sometimes we think of these miraculous situations like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Where, where they come walking victoriously out of the fire. Or maybe like Daniel in the lion's den, who comes out of the mouth of the lions and is not touched at all. Or maybe, maybe it's like Peter, who is miraculously taken out of the prison. and We don't know how he escaped through those walls and those chains fall off of him in Acts chapter 12. Or maybe it's like Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, where they're in prison and, the, and there's an earthquake and they walk out victoriously, and God rescues them in that way. But the Scriptures teach that sometimes God answers prayers in ways that we don't expect. And John's own testimony was that Jesus must increase and He must decrease. And no doubt that this was God's providential way of making John decrease while he is in prison while preparing the way for the role of the Savior. And though he, what was about to happen was probably not the way that John thought he would decrease. As John maybe was praying for deliverance, there's a party that's going on outside those dungeon walls in the palace. Because Herod had invited all these officials, the military officers, the big wigs of that day, to a birthday party. And during that party, Matthew chapter 14, verse 6, tells us that he had his stepdaughter come in and dance before them. She was probably a teenager, if you put the math together with Josephus and others. And, and she comes in and she does this dance for all of them. And these older men are greatly pleased with the kind of dancing that she does. So we know it's not ballet. We know it's not square dancing or anything of that nature. It's very provocative. And lusting after his own stepdaughter after that dance, Herod declares, you can have whatever you want. Up to half my kingdom. You get it, whatever it is. Well, the teenager wants to make the most of this situation. So she goes and she seeks advice from her mother, Herod Herodias. And she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? Up to half the kingdom, we can have anything. Gold, silver, all, all the things we'd ever want. Now, for, for almost two years now, Herodias has, has been nursing her grudge against John the Baptist with that statement that she can't do what she wants to do, be married to Herod. And it wasn't enough to know that for the last two years, John has been in prison or that probably he wasn't going to be getting out anytime soon. Her grudge now was outright hatred. No one was going to tell her she could not do what she wanted to do. She wasn't thinking about what was best for her daughter. The only thing she was thinking about was how she could get her revenge on John. And so what she says to her daughter is, go and tell him you want the head of John the Baptist. And so she goes back the daughter does with her request. And even though the king did not want to do this, he knew it was wrong and he was scared of what might happen in the future, even if he is just being superstitious. Because of the guest, because of his reputation, he grants it to her. Herod orders this executioner to go in and cut off the head of John the Baptist. He commanded him to bring back his head and they went and had him beheaded in prison. Surely no one ever expected this. John had prayed to get out of prison, but I assume he expected to get out in one piece. He's getting out of prison, but not the way he expected. And brethren, here is a man who stood up for God. The reason he is arrested in the first place is because he is talking about the truth, even when it's hard. And now he loses his life because some teenager does this provocative dance in front of her stepfather. And we all may feel like that's not what I expected to happen to a person of God. But now going back to Matthew chapter 11, what Jesus has to say is pretty remarkable about John the Baptist. In verse 7, as these disciples were going back to take the message back to John, 
Jesus began to speak to the multitudes about John. What, what did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? Think about a long reed that just as the wind comes, it goes back and forth, vacillating. That's not John. John, you knew where he stood, and he did what was right. He stood up tall in the face of opposition. What would you go out to see? A man dressed in, in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in, in king's palaces. You're looking for a, a yes man, a man who's going to tell the king whatever he wants to hear? They live in palaces. That's not John. John isn't going to tell you what you want to hear. He's going to tell you what you need to hear. But why'd you go out? See a prophet? Yes. And I say to you, he is one that is more than He's a prophet of prophets. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. He's talking about a prophecy of Malachi there. Truly, I say to you, among those who are born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That is quite a compliment, isn't it? Especially when you think about men like Abraham. You think about men like Samuel, Moses, and, and David, all, all of these great men. And he says, yet here is someone who is greater. But God came through for John differently than he did for men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. John never walked out of the prison cell. Instead, he flew away with the angels. And that was probably different than what he expected. But it was a far better ending, if you think about it. John was as faithful to God when he was alone in the desert as when crowds were pouring in around him to hear the gospel preached. But he was equally faithful during those long months of being in prison. So what do we learn from all this? Well, the most obvious application is that life will not always play out the way that we think it will. And I think we especially need to keep that in mind in light of even becoming a Christian. Because sometimes people have this idea that when they become a Christian, life will just be perfect. For example, they say, well, I thought that if I became a Christian, there'd be no more problems. If there's anything that we learn from John's life is that even if you are faithful to God, there are going to be trials. There are going to be difficulties. Uh, it, being baptized, it washes away our sins. It doesn't wash away our problems. However, being a child of God does help us deal with our problems in a way that we never could beforehand. It, we can now can pray to God. As Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in the time of need. Something that we didn't have before we became a child of God. That we can go before the very throne of the creator of this universe knowing that he will give us mercy that we need sufficient for the problems that we go through. And we have the encouragement of our brethren around us. And we have a hope. This life, brethren, is not meant to be perfect, but the life to come is. And that is what these problems in this life make us do, is long for, yearn for that time where there will be no more tears, where there will be no more sorrows, and we will be with our God for eternity. When we make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, the important thing is, is that our faith survives our circumstances. Or, or sometimes we, we think, well, I thought when I became a Christian, that there wouldn't be any temptations anymore. Sometimes we're deceived into thinking that the things that were a temptation before we became a Christian, that won't be so much of a temptation anymore. But that expectation is not based upon the Word of God. The Bible never hints at the fact that temptations cease after we become a Christian. In fact, the Bible promises us that sometimes more trials, more temptations will come as a result of being a child of God. Sometimes the fact is, is that Satan knows he has to work harder on us than he did before we became a Christian. It's a false expectation that is planted in our minds by the devil that there will not be temptations anymore. He uses as a tool to think, you know, if this is the way it is as a Christian, then why even be a Christian? Why not just go back to the way I was beforehand where I didn't feel guilty about it? Like with trials, temptations don't go away when a person becomes a Christian. However, the strength to overcome those temptations is stronger. That Christ can do all things, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us to do what is right. Or maybe I thought that other Christians would deal, would live life differently than they are. 
And I think this is a big disappointment for us, many of us who are Christians. When you find out that there are others who claim to be children of God that you think are like you, who aren't living the way they ought to. They're living some secret life. And you expect everyone else around you to try to live as righteously as you're trying to live. And you come to find out that, that some people don't care. And that can be discouraging. And it can tempt, again, us into thinking, well, why should I try? But we have to realize that only God will not disappoint you. Our brethren will disappoint us. It happens. Our family will disappoint us. Our spouses will disappoint us. But God will never disappoint us. And though we strive for perfection, no one is perfect. But realize that even the strongest Christians among you have problems, that they are still growing too. Or maybe we think, well, you know, I thought when I became a Christian that others then would follow suit, that they would be converted as well. But again, that can be very disappointed. Disappointing. You think, well, I just received the gospel. Surely I'm going to go out and tell everyone else about this, and they're going to be just as excited, only to find out no one else is interested, it seems like. You know, John may have expected Herod and Herodias to, to change, but he was disappointed. And, and when people aren't converted, remember that the problem is not in the Word. It's in the unbeliever's heart. But don't let their response discourage you from proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ even further. Though many didn't heed John's preaching, he just kept on preaching. Or sometimes we think, well, you know, I thought I knew everything. You mean there's more? What do you, what do you mean? You know, as a new Christian, we study and we learn more and more. Each and every day, no matter how many decades you've been a Christian, you're learning more and more about the Word of God. But I think sometimes you, you become a child of God and inevitably what happens is you learn that there are some things that you didn't realize. Some things that you thought were acceptable but weren't. And as you learn those things, you might say, well, I didn't expect I'd have to give that up. Or the Bible's view of this practice is not what I expected. But again, the issue is not with what you expected, but what is the truth? And are you going to change? The good news is that when you have a good and honest heart, it will conform to what is right, even if it wasn't what you expected. But here's the thing. Through our lives, we understand that it may not, things may not end up the way that we expected them to. That doesn't mean that it's not the way that God expected it to be. And I think that's the case in John's life. John's ministry was to prepare the world for this coming Christ as it says in the book of Isaiah. And he did his work, and he did it well. Jesus said in Matthew 11 and verse 10, this is the one who, of whom it was said that he was coming to prepare the way. John had no idea that the ministry that he was to have would be a short one and that it would keep him from even reaching probably his 35th birthday. By the time John was executed, much of that public fame that he knew at one point was already forgotten, or more importantly, it was replaced by the ministry of Jesus Christ. That probably wasn't John's expectation, but it was God's. This was God's plan. But that being said, I believe if you saw John and you asked him, was it worth it, this, this early death? John would have said, I wouldn't have missed it for all the world. You see, what may not be in our plans or how we would have done it, may be the plan that God chose providentially for us to accomplish His purposes. Maybe that's the way it is in your life today. Maybe things have not gone the way you expected them to turn out. As you looked to your life and you looked 10, 20, 30 years down the road, things aren't turning out that way. But sometimes it turns out the way it does for God's purposes, and we have to realize that. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You know, this is a verse that I think is often misused, misused and abused. It doesn't mean that it's always going to turn out good, that this bad thing is going to turn out for this great thing over here. That's not always the case, is it? But what it does mean is for those who love the Lord, in the end, it will always turn out for the best. Maybe not in this life, it will always turn out for the best if you are faithful to God. And that's what we're called to do.
Brethren, we can't control our circumstances many times, but we can control how we react to them. We live in a world of disappointments. There are disappointing times during, a, during the economy goes bad. There's disappointments with family. There are disappointments within the church where you can't avoid the fact that people are going to let you down, where circumstances turn out differently from the way that you expected and hoped that they would. But in a world of disappointment, Jesus came to bring hope. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 33, it says, He who believes in him will not be disappointed. People will disappoint you all the time, but God will never disappoint you. You see, one thing in life is for sure, that though things in this life may not turn out the way that we expect them to do, things will be much better than we expect when we make it to heaven. Our responsibility is simply to draw near to God. Thank you for your attention this morning.